Okay. So it looks like it is recording. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> all good. We appreciate it. Thank you, Marini. Thank you for telling me before Dr. Tunnell started speaking. We don't care what I have to say, but we definitely want to capture what he has to say. Um, so just really quickly again, so we are recording. The recordings will be available on the teachlarc.org website um, momentarily within the next couple of days. Um, if you have questions throughout Dr. Tano's presentation, you are more than welcome to raise your question in a variety of ways. You can raise your hand using the raise your hand icon in chat. I think, I'm sorry, down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Most of you are probably familiar with that. Or you can type your question into the chat and we will hopefully be able to get to your question. Also, if you're interested in getting a certificate of participation for this workshop, those certificates will be emailed to you at the close of the virtual workshop series. So the workshop series closes tomorrow evening. We have our closing session from 5.30 to 7 and probably give us 24 to 48 hours after that to get your certificate. And that will be emailed to you. Whatever email you use to register, that will be the email where you will, you will receive your certificate. And it will be a certificate for the whole conference is my understanding, right? Not for individual sessions. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna kind of be the moderator here um, to help with the chat. And I have uh, Leah Martinez and Renee Marshall who are gonna also help with the waiting room and the chat because we still have folks coming in. We're already at almost 50 people. This is super duper exciting. So I'm going to go ahead without further ado and introduce our speaker, Dr. Tano. So Dr. Tano has been in secondary math education for the past 18 years. He started teaching middle school math for the Hawaii State Department of Education before moving to Los Angeles to attend the University of Southern California, where he earned his master's in teaching and doctor of education degree with an emphasis in educational psychology and technology. Currently, he is teaching at Culver City High School and serving as a math coach and department chair. Dr. Tano also recently worked at Antioch University, Los Angeles as an adjunct professor. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to my dear, dear friend and math teacher extraordinaire, <laughs> Dr. Kiao Tano. Thank Hello, you so everybody. much. Woo Thank you, Marini. Thank you so much of for course. that introduction. Um, I'm so glad you guys are here. Welcome. Um, so yeah, let me start with my screen share here and get that going. So hopefully you guys are in the right place and we are looking at uh, how your, what understanding your role in the math classroom to help students overcome math anxiety. So. I'm just gonna start off and uh, Marini is going to be monitoring the chat and looking at your, uh, your hands up and hopefully we'll catch them. If not, then keep putting them up till, till we see you. Real quick, I want all of you to find your emojis and I want you to put up an emoji that represents your feelings either towards math or when you are a math student like what emoji represents you when you think about math? So I'm gonna give you about 20 seconds to do that. Let's see what you guys come up with. So I'm gonna find my emojis as well and see if I can put it up. Okay, I see some scary faces, some shock faces, cry faces. <laughs> this is great. Awesome. So uh, is anybody here a math person? Wants to put up their hand and say, I'm a math person. Uh, everybody is at a different place when it comes to math education and math learning. Uh, but our job as a teacher is to help our students to learn and understand and grow and believe in themselves as math learners. Um, a wise teacher once told me, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But you can make sure they're very thirsty. And so that's kind of our role as a teacher. We need to make our students thirsty. Thirsty for learning, thirsty for math. 
Um, so a lot of times when we think about our role as teachers, we think that we are there to share our content knowledge. Uh, but if you think about it, YouTube can do that. You know, textbooks can do that. So our role as a teacher is far greater than just sharing our content, but actually we become motivators. We, our job is to motivate our students to want to learn. And that's where, you know, the unteachable teacher skills come into play. Like you, how are you going to become a successful motivator to help students want to learn in, their, in your classrooms? Um, and there are a lot of things that can hinder that, uh, things that you believe in, things that they believe in. And so my presentation today is just talking on three different skills or keys that hopefully will help you to improve the motivation behind student learning in your classroom. So let's, let's start with a little bit of math. Who's ready to do some calculations, all right? So pull out your calculators. You're welcome to use your phone, okay? And I want you to think about this, quest, this math question here. So I'm gonna show you a picture and I want you to, and you can just jot, just jot this down on the side, explain how this student was able to get the standard form from the quadratic equation. Or use the quadratic formula to find the roots of this equation. So hopefully you guys remember your, your math algebra one skills, okay? Because in order to get an A, you're gonna to have to get this question right, okay? Now, by the way, if you get an answer wrong or don't know how to do this, uh, we're going to put your name up on the board so everyone will know that you failed, okay? And also just so you know, I have, I have your names on the chat. So I'm gonna be contacting your parents so that they know that you have not succeeded. And uh, you might get grounded, you know, but that's okay. You don't need to go to your college classes. You can be grounded. Um, and, you know, I know that there are other things going on in your life that are taking precedence over this math problem here, but just know that you have to get it correct, okay? Oh, and also as a presenter, I'm gonna look down on you because, you know, you're supposed to know this. You've already gone to school. You guys are college students. So I expect you to get this answer correct, okay? So how many of you got it right? Um, so let's look at this. How many of you felt like these students when I put up that math question? Or how many of you felt like this student when I put up that math question? Um, so this is not the math classroom. So you're, I was just kidding. You don't have to do that math problem, but you know, if you want to do it, you're welcome to do it. But I kind of wanted to get your juices pumping and help you feel the emotions behind math education and the kinds of emotions that our students felt. Uh, so take a minute, right? And I want you to share out what was your reaction upon realizing you had to do math? Um, you can write it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and speak out. Uh, Dr. Smith will be reading any chat comments, but I'm curious what you guys felt when you had to, when you thought, oh my gosh, I had to do math. So far, what I'm reading in the chat, it was intimidating. I felt dumb for forgetting the quadratic formula. Anxious. It's been a while since I'm, it's been, a, it's since it's been a while, I'm too old, 38, I panic that I forget. Anxious, panicked, ready to leave the workshop. <laughs> so glad you did it. We're so glad you stayed, Melissa. Uh, sad that I didn't remember how. Total panic. Had to prepare a lot. Thank you, Leah. It's been a while. Caught off guard. Tired. I just came out of a calculus exam. Phew. Well, thanks for coming here. Blank out. Nervous. Yes. The frightened emoji face. This oh, one. Yeah. <laughs> So what you guys are feeling is exactly what our students feel. And as a teacher, we have to be empathetic to the fact that they are feeling that and we have to adjust. And what can we do in our classroom so that um, we can eliminate some of those feelings within our students and help them want to learn, right? So I have some keys that I wanted to share with you. Uh, oh, we did that. So 
the first thing you really want to do, so, so our goal here, right, is to get our students to not feel what you guys just felt. And you being the math teacher, right, it, these are some things that you can do. And whether you are the math teacher or not a math teacher, and actually this presentation is more for non-math teachers, um, but in general educators and also parents. So what we wanna do is we wanna first reframe the math conversation for our students. So a lot of problems that arise in our society um, around math is because of the value that we put on math education. Um, as a math teacher, I feel like, oh, you know, math is kind of one of the less popular subjects. People don't really like math. You know, that's what a lot of people think. And so what we wanna do here is we wanna reframe the math conversation. And part of that is creating a different mindset around mathematics. Um, here are some common phrases that, you, that people say. They say, oh, I'm not a math person or it's too hard, I hate math, it's not my thing, I can't do math, I don't wanna feel dumb, I was never good at math, math was never my strong suit, I'm bad in math, and I, I had bad math teachers. These are very common things that we say. And so instead of saying those things, because you know they might be true, but that's okay, um, for our students, we wanna reframe those ways of thinking. Um, so whether or not we feel that this is true, we don't want our students to also come in line with our feelings towards math. And so we wanna approach it with more of a, a growth mindset um, and replace those feelings with sentences like, I'm not a math person yet. So I love teaching the word yet in my classrooms. It's like the best word ever. Like you, you're not a math person yet, but you still can be. Um, I believe I can do math. With help, I can succeed. With effort, I can progress. I will use a strategy that I've learned. Numbers can support my ideas. Making mistakes helps me improve. With enough practice, I can gain confidence. So these are kind of the, the mindsets we wanna change around our thinking towards math, okay? So here's a quick example. So what if somebody said, I want you guys to think this, what would you think if somebody said, oh, I don't need to know English? Or I don't know how to read or I never use language in real life, or blank subject is more important than blank. Science is dumb. You can get by without knowing history. So these are kind of sentences that in our society would be unacceptable. You cannot go around, even if you couldn't read, people don't typically go around announcing that I don't know how to read. Or even if you think science is dumb, you really don't say that out loud. Or if you don't know history, you don't wanna tell people you don't know history. So these are common phrases that in our society, people don't typically use. However, if we replace them with the word math, I think all of you would agree that, that it's in society, it is acceptable to say this. It's okay for us to say, you don't need to know math. It's okay for us to say, I don't know how to do math. I never use math in real life. Um, blank subject is more important than math. Math is dumb. You can get by without uh, knowing math. Um, so, you know, we can't control what parents say or what people say outside of the classroom, but as educators, we wanna make sure that we don't um, say these kinds of things in our own classrooms. Um, I often hear sometimes like at an all staff meeting, uh, teachers, other te non-math teachers will say, oh, no, we can't do math, or oh, they, math, da, da, da. so those are things that are often said, and it's accepted, but that's one of the things we want to change in our school system. Okay, so the big question as a math teacher, you know, and for you as educators, it's important to understand, why do we have to learn math? Dr. Tano, why am I learning this? You know, that's the question I get, like, every year. Um, Am I ever gonna use this when I get older? Like that, that's like what everybody thinks about when they think about math. But there's a big misconception about math education. And that misconception is that you're learning math so that you can use math when you grow up. But that's not true. I mean, guys, I use the calculator on my phone all the time. Um, I have, I, you know, you look at uh, loan calculators, you have all these tools that you can use. You don't really have to use your brain to calculate the math when you get older. 
For example, the quadratic formula, how many of you have used the quadratic formula since ninth grade? Probably none of you. Uh, so that's the misconception. And because of that, students feel like they don't have to learn math. However, this is what I tell students when they think they have to learn math. I said, first, you need to know what is a cognitive function. So the reason why we learn math is because it helps our brain to develop what is called cognitive functions. And this are, these are the skills that help you to solve problems, make decisions, and actually teaches your brain how to think. So what is a cognitive function? Cognitive functions constitute the ability to work with information in a meaningful way, apply that information that has already been gained, perform preferential changes, and the ability for someone to change opinions about that information. So it's very important for us to develop our cognitive functions. It's basically our decision-making skills. It's our intelligent skills. And you can develop cognitive functions in all of the disciplines. As you read, you're developing cognitive functions. As you're studying and memorizing facts for um, history lessons, you are developing cognitive functions. And math is another discipline where you are actually developing these cognitive functions so that when you get older, your brain has the connections to make decision, smart decision making. So when you're a child, one of the first uh, cognitive functions that you, you develop is like recognizing shapes. That's a big one. Another one is recognizing your own reflection in a mirror. And so there are different age, um, uh, stages of life where you develop these different cognitive functions. Sometimes as an infant and as you get older, you develop different ones. So once you hit um, your school age years for, from first grade up to high school, your brain is at a different place where it can develop higher cognitive functions and uh, more abstract cognitive functions. And so if we miss that chance when we're in high school or middle school to develop those through math education, then we are gonna be at a disadvantage as we get older. And some of you see that in the world around us. Some of you see people who have no ability to really understand logic, you know, cause and effect. Um, there's a lot of anti-science out there. There's a lot of, uh, uh, when you look at our political view on both sides of the aisle, you know, you have people who are really struggle to like see the other side. That's because of the cognitive functioning. And then we call people stupid. You're like, oh, there's so many idiots out there. You know, we want people to develop these cognitive functions so that they can put information together. And that's why we want to learn mathematics. Um, for my students, I tell them, oh, okay, so have you ever played a game, like a board game or a card game? And there's somebody who can like really strategize to win that game. Like they're always winning the board game and you can't understand why I'm like, well, that student has developed their cognitive functions. Um, or I tell them, have you ever heard a joke and you just didn't get it? Those are cognitive functions. So we want as many of those as we can get. Um, the second reason which I tell my students why they need to learn math education is because they don't know yet what they're going to do when they grow up. They don't know what path they're going to take. And so math is uh, the door of opportunity. For example, if they don't know math is an option for them, then they're, they're cutting themselves off to a lot of opportunities. And then the last one, which is pretty important, and I tell them you have to be competitive internationally. Um, if we look at the statistics of around education between countries, you know, it can be a little scary for us. Are we graduating the same uh, number of students, uh, high performing students as other countries? You know, when they become, unfortunately, I tell them, you know, with, with my generation, I had to compete with people like here in the United States, but with your generation, you're gonna to have to compete with everybody in the world, basically. If somebody wants your job and they're highly qualified, they could take it. So you wanna prepare yourself for that. All right, any questions so far? Search in the chat, you can unmute. Okay, 
And you know, lastly, you can't use what you don't know. So you wanna create a larger tool bag for you. So helping students to understand the why behind learning mathematics is going to help them to um, get rid of their fear behind math or their hesitation towards learning math or their feelings that this is not important. Okay. So why do you think it's important to reframe the math conversation? Hearing others share low views of math contributes to students' attitudes towards math. So when a child goes home and their parent tells them that math is not important, they take that with them to the classroom. Um, students need examples from you of a growth mindset around math ability. So it's okay to not be a math person, but you wanna be willing to try. Changing your perceptions will change their motivations and it can help to relieve math anxiety. Uh, okay, so let me look at my notes to make sure I'm not missing any information. So when you devalue math, right, but you highly value a grade, which is typically what we do in school, that creates math anxiety. Um, and so let's think about math anxiety here for a second. We want to remove and address math anxiety. How many of you guys have math anxiety? Anybody? So can you think, what do you guys think math anxiety is? Anybody wanna share out? Uh, we don't have post-it notes, but you can write either in the chat or you can speak out. What do you think math anxiety is? I'll give you 20 seconds. Marina, anything, anything coming up? Yes, lots of goodies. So I'm seeing not being as smart as others. I do when it comes to tests or timed problems, fear of not getting the answers right, avoiding math at all costs. I get very nervous and stressed out and just give up before trying. Being afraid to learn or not being able to do things because you're nervous or afraid or scared of failure. I feel like why can't I understand how to solve the problems? Feeling pressure, the feeling of stress when you feel unprepared or knowledgeable. It's physically debilitating. People with learning disabilities not feeling like they're achieving the best of their abilities, scared and not wanting to answer. It's a panic state of mind, not mm -hmm. knowing what to do and giving up on yourself. Stress and emotions related to testing. If I get the wrong answer, people will think I'm dumb. They're, mm -hmm. they're still coming in. Yeah. <laughs> Good, so keep sharing if you guys wanna share. So math anxiety um, leads to poor performance, right? And it's a vicious cycle because as you are performing poor, poorly, it creates more math anxiety and it's just cycles through and cycles through. So the goal then is to remove the math anxiety to improve the, import, the, the performance, which will then change this cycle of constantly feeling like you're, fa you're failing. It is a debilitating, debilitating negative emotional response to math, to mathematics. A feeling of tension and anxiety, and a lot of you have said this in your comments, a feeling of, of tension and anxiety that interferes with the manipulation of numbers and the solving of mathematical problems in ordinary life and academic situations. And also math anxiety is very different to test anxiety. Um, because math anxiety comes in the form of when you see numbers, whereas testing anxiety is something totally different and can occur in all of the math, all of your education classes. And just so you know, um, math anxiety does not mean that a student cannot do math. They can very well do math, but math anxiety is something that prevents them from actually performing math. So you can think of it kind of like a, um, like stage fright, right? You have people who can sing and they can dance and they're very excellent singers and dancers. But the second they get up in front of people to perform, they freeze up. 
it doesn't mean they don't have the ability. It just means that their anxiety has prevented them from performing. And as teachers, we have to understand that and not think, oh, you don't know math or you are, you are just because you're a poor performer of math that you actually have poor ability, which is not true. Um, okay, so what we wanna do, right? We want to change that cycle. Let's see. Because math, and, uh, math anxiety can, can occur in perfectly intelligent and capable human beings. And then there's math anxiety and performance versus math anxiety and ability, which are two different things as well. Are there any questions so far, guys? So math anxiety and ability comes from, stems from their math anxiety, uh, their performance due to the lack of ability versus due to the lack of their ability to perform. So why do students have math anxiety, right? Um, students have math anxiety because of past failures. There's too, much too many consequences on them when they don't perform. There are too many limits on their, uh, and restrictions on time, on knowledge. Too many requirements that they have to do, prerequisite knowledge, expectation pressures from parents and peers and teachers. So if we want to eliminate math anxiety in our students, we have to eliminate all these kinds of things, which you know is a whole different topic, which is one of my favorite topics, but grading in, in schools, right? I'm kind of skipping around here, please forgive me. So we, when we look at getting rid of all of these things, we have to look at how we structure our classrooms. Um, how are we grading our students and what value do we put on our, our, our grades versus learning in the classroom? So how do we do it? We wanna give students the opportunity for a productive struggle. And this doesn't mean let them struggle and like throw them off of the deep end, but we want to allow them with the, your guidance to be able to struggle without, without feeling like, fa like failing. We wanna replace their past history with new stories. So in your classroom, you want to give them opportunities for success. Um, it, outside of a test, you know, because test is, tests are one of the biggest creators of math anxiety. And so you don't always have to test. You know, I'm a big proponent for less tests. Uh, in the classroom, we want um, multiple measures, right, of a student's ability. We want to give them multiple opportunities to prove their learning and not have them prove their learning through a grade but through any and various different kinds of feedback. Remove the deadlines and limits that have consequences. You know, just because a student doesn't learn something on your timeline doesn't mean that they can't learn it. You know, students have their own timelines and it's important to accept their timeline. Take away the grade. You know, this is a very um, unpopular opinion. But you guys are the upcoming new teachers. You're the ones who we look at to change the whole old traditional way of grading because you know the ways that we have been grading for the past 100 years literally have not changed in 100 years is not the best way. You know, it's the system that we have now, but that system has to change. I'm a proponent of taking away the grade. Why? Because the grade is what causes the anxiety. It's the label, you know? Instead, you wanna teach for learning. You wanna you want help students to motivate to learn for the sake of learning rather than learning for the sake of their grade. What does it mean? It means don't give grades for homework. You don't, do you need to give grades for homework? I don't think so. And you know, everybody has their own opinions on this one, but it's, a, it's an equity, equity issue to me is when you're giving grades for homework. Homework does not prove what a student has learned. It proves that if they have time after school to do their homework or if they have help after school to complete it. And if they don't have that, then it's not gonna get done. Don't give grades for participation. Don't give grades for projects, right? Students need to be able to do math, the math working class without the pressure of grades. 
but rather for learning because they understand that everything they do in class is for the purpose of learning and not for grades. So grades should only reflect what they have learned. So there is no need to give grades for dumb things like homework, you know, other things like that. That's not really pertinent to what they have learned. Um, you want the grade, you want to take away the sting of the grade. So I'll give you an example. When my students first come to my class and they take their first test, they are very scared. They feel they need to do their best on this test. This is their one and only chance. And if they don't, they're, it's gonna set them up for failure for the rest of the, the semester. But what I kind of help them learn is like, the test is just one opportunity, but they should have many opportunities. If they don't do well during this test, they can try again. And you know what? They can try again and again, as many times as they need to show you that they have learned. Um, Teachers are sometimes against this because they're like, oh, retakes, you know, retakes are a bad idea. Well, not if you make retakes meaningful. Um, it's not a free retake. So I tell my students, you know, you don't get, get to just take it over and over again. I want you to show me that you've learned. How are you going to show me that you've learned? I want to see some work that you've done successfully. And when I see that you have done it successfully, you can try again, whether that be next week, two weeks from now, a month from now. Um, and when they do try it again and their, ch their grade changes, they realize that, oh, the grade has less of a sting. And it kind of eliminates their anxiety while taking the test. And it helps them to see that actually learning is what's more important than the grade. Okay, next, you want to celebrate failure. You got me. Yes? You found an apple seed? Cool. Yeah. I'll mute them. Oh, okay. Oh, I think you're muted. Hang on. You're muted, Gail. <laughs> uh, fail uh oh, okay. Okay, there we go. Can you there we that? go. Okay. Yes, sorry about that. Saying that failure is part of the learning process. You know, we want students to learn and we want to celebrate their failures because um, if we punish them for their failures, they're going to be afraid to fail. Uh, we want to celebrate them. Failing is fun. Failing is needed. This is what I tell my students. We learn from our failing. We cannot look at failure as derogatory because um, essentially what we're doing is we're devaluing the process. So when we celebrate the failure, it becomes part of the process that helps us to get rid of that anxiety so that they feel like it's okay to do that because failing is okay. Um, when there's no grades, there's less uh, feeling of grade of failure. Uh, okay. Remember that the purpose of failure is to learn how to be better. You want the students to know what they don't know, right? Rather than focus on their failure. Okay, next. Believe in all, believe all of your students can learn. So this is a big one for teachers. And as a, as a veteran teacher and as a math coach, you know, we as teachers go into the profession with really great intentions and our heart is in the right place. But a lot of times we do find that teachers actually don't believe that all of their students can learn. And that's one thing that we have to work on. Like everybody needs to work on that. We have to work on ourselves to believe that all of our students can learn. And the fact of the matter is that our students' brains do have the capability to learn and process information, right? They all have the same ability to learn and process information, so they can do it. The problem is that there are other factors at play. There are social emotional factors, there's uh, family issues, personal issues, they are teenagers, they are children, and all of these things come into play that affect their brain's ability to process this information, right? But they still can learn. And so you must believe that they can learn. So part of that is evaluating your own values and your own biases. 
You know, you got to tackle these hard things because your values and biases was essentially dictate if you can believe all students can learn in your class. So your value, your beliefs are based on your values, right? Two different things, what you believe and what you value. So what are your core values? Anybody want to think that they can uh, share out what they think their core values are? I'm gonna put up a, let's see. can you guys see my screen here with the, the list of words? Yes, we can see it. So this is an activity which typically I would do with people in person, but you can, you can um, I will put it in the chat and you can have this document at home in case you wanna try this later. So this is an activity where you know you circle 10 of these values that you think are most important to you. So you can do this when you when you guys on your own later on. And so after you have your 10 values that you circled, and then what I would do is I would tell you, okay, now I want you to cross out five of them and only keep five. So you have to think hard, what are the five that you're going to keep? Okay. Now, after you have your five, I would tell you to cross out two more, and then you're gonna end up with three. Right? These are going to be your core values. So these values is what you bring to your students, right? <clears throat> and they, your actions are, Ste your actions stem off of your core values. Okay. All right. So let's see here. Growth mindset. I know that all of you have, have learned about growth mindset. And so I'm not going to go too much into the growth mindset part of it. But the point about growth mindset I wanted to share with you is that growth mindset is not only for students. It's not students. It's not something we want to develop within our students but also something as teachers we need to develop within ourselves. So what is your growth mindset around your students' ability to succeed? Do you believe that they can see, succeed or do you look at them and already have it checked that? You know, I know the statistics, for example, I know the statistics, 30% of algebra students are gonna fail. So I'm gonna look at my class and I'm gonna see, okay, which one, one of you are going to be that 30% that will fail. A lot of us have that in the back of our minds and then perform based off of those kinds of beliefs that we have about our students. So we need to develop a growth mindset um, for ourselves. Okay. So um, behavior follows beliefs. We act based on our belief systems. You must truly believe that every one of your students can succeed in your class. This is a must, right? You want to believe that everybody can succeed. You cannot teach someone you don't believe in. Um, so that is my uh, presentation for you guys. And I wanted to leave some time for some question and answers if you guys had any question and answers for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Tano. That was super, super helpful and relatable and engaging and so many great nuggets of, of wisdom and information there. And so a lot of folks were putting things into the chat. So I'll make sure that I save that and, and get it to you. And I see we have a hand up, Itati. Hopefully I said that correctly, Itati. Yes, that was correct. Go for it, what's your question? So my question is, um, when it comes to, by the way, I'm sorry, uh, I love the presentation, hit every point that I was um, curious about and very good information. Um, my question is, uh, when it comes to students with learning disabilities, I know that that's completely different because um, um, me, uh, me, myself, I have learning disabilities. So in elementary school all the way to now, I still have my IEP. Mm -hmm. So I know that, you know, that, is the basics for telling each teacher what the student struggles with, um, what they need to improve. So do you think there are certain um, areas that the teacher can connect with the student to help them learn better if they have a learning disability, like a different route? 
So we, when we look at the learning disabilities, right? We, a student's learning disability can either change the way they are learning math or changing what they are learning in math. Mm -hmm. And so a teacher's responsibility is to act based off of that. So if a student has a disability that uh, you know, means that they need to learn math in a different way, then um, they need to work with their uh, special ed case carriers. They need to differentiate for that student and change things in their classroom so that that student can succeed. Um, if, uh, if there is a situation where the student's disability uh, prevents them from learning what they have to learn in class, and that's where the modifications come into play, and the teacher should, again, modify instruction, modify uh, the content so that the student can succeed. Most importantly is that we don't want students, whether they have a disability severe disability or a little disability for them to feel that because of their disability, they cannot succeed in the classroom. This is different from content, you know, like, and this is why so many students are so stuck on content in grades. And we have to understand that the classroom experience is so much more than just content and grades. We need to set them up for, for success for the rest of their life. That means creating in them the belief that they can learn, giving them success in the classroom so that we can stop the cycle of feeling bad about math, right? And just stop thinking that, you know, the student's value is based off of the grade that they're gonna get, or the student's value is based off of how much knowledge they have um, acquired in the classroom when they have a disability. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, it did. Thank you. Thank you for your question. That was great. I love questions. If anybody else have any other questions, I'm happy to talk through with you. If you had any concerns about anything that was said, um, I'm sorry that we we ended a little early, um, but usually we ha I have activities to go with it that takes a little longer, but over Zoom, it, it goes by so fast. <laughs> Totally. So we have a question from Jennifer, and then I'll um, go to a couple of ponderings in the chat. Go ahead, Stephanie. I'm sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> no problem. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Tano. I had a question. Um, do you have any other resources that um, you'd like for us to um, dive deeper into? Um, I'm sorry that I had to join uh, um, around 1230, so I, I missed uh, many of the um, presentation, but I was wondering, um, because I myself, uh, my experience is learning math um, here in LA and in South Korea has not been very positive. It's actually been traumatic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could recommend um, uh, any books or um, podcasts or things mm -hmm. of that nature. You know, I, I've been a math, a math coach for the past six years. And a lot of my uh, training comes from standards-based grading. I'm not sure how much you guys have heard about that. I put my email in the chat, by the way, in case any of you guys have any other questions. Um, but the, the ideas about grading are with standards-based based grading theories are really what drive what I had to say you know, looking at the grades and rethinking our traditional grading system, because that's what's going to change what you do in your classrooms. Um, one resource which you can do is uh, there is a group led by uh, a professor named Ken O'Connor, and he's one of the um, big uh, professors, and he wrote books around uh, standards-based grading and Matthew Townsend, I don't, know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with these names, but they run a Facebook group called Standards-Based Grading. And you can post questions in there and they'll answer questions and people will give their input and you can really learn a lot from there. Um, there are some other books that I can recommend that I don't have on the top of my he head, but if you email me, I will find the titles and I can send them to you. And I see a question in the chat here. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Uh, you feel so hopeful, but then when you when you try to do math again, the negative feelings return, and that's absolutely true. They do return. 
um, because it's a cycle and you and you have a history, a lot of us have a history of um, our math failures. And so it's not easy for those to go away. It, it, it takes more than just yourself. And this is why as a teacher with our students, it, they're not going to be able to do it on their own. They're not gonna be able to get rid of their math anxiety on their own to start feeling positive, to be grateful for their faith. They're not gonna do that on their own. It comes from your guidance. So you're the one that's going to have to work on that. Just like how, you know, um, let's see. Oralia, I think is the one that asked the question, just like how, you know, you come to a session like this and you hear somebody talk about, you feel better about yourself. And then you, you go home and you try math again, and then you feel bad again. So you want to give yourselves more experiences where you're feeling good. So if you're in a math classroom or any classroom with a teacher that's making you feel good about learning failure, about um, hindrances, then the more of those experiences you have, then the less painful it will be. Tulia, do you have a question? Um, yeah, I, I'm homeschooling right now, my, my five-year-old. And um, she just had this uh, standardized uh, exam. And I mean, it was crazy just seeing the math because she's barely learning how to count 10 by 10s until 60. And mm -hmm. I mean, she got this, uh, some questions in the exams the 300 plus 100 how much is it and what is the number between 79 and and 81 or something like that and mm -hmm. and my daughter she she got so frustrated and and she's like I don't want to do this no more and she just ran into the room and she wanted to cry and all this and I mean how do you do those standardized for for kindergartens you know because uh -huh. I mean it, you're just seeing this stuff in in the classroom and then you get the the exams and I'm seeing the exams because I'm homeschooling and I'm like whoa we're not even covering this in the classroom how are they being tested this mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. exams you know it, it's crazy yeah. Yeah. it is crazy and you know a lot of times those standardized testing are not healthy for our students and it's a state requirement that they all take it but this goes back to, um, you know, a lot of times when students get frustrated and they cry when they're taking a test, it's because they see the value of that test and they see that value of the test because you value that test. And so what you want to do is you want to value many things and not just the test. So as a teacher, like I don't value my tests any more than I value a warm up activity or a game or a lesson or notes, or you want, to you want them to see that you value everything just as much or more than the test. If they see that you are valuing the tests, and this is all subconscious, this is why in my presentation that you have to work on your, on your own belief systems because you are projecting that to your students. When we show our students that tests are the most important thing and they fail at that test, it creates really bad math anxiety. And so we want them to feel successes outside of that test and help them understand that the test is just one single measurement. It's not the end all be all. It's not a interpretation of their value because they think that they think, oh, because I couldn't do that, I am not valuable. Or because I couldn't do that, I am not smart. And those are the ideas that we wanna get out of their head. So, so what? They don't do good on the test. That's okay. We'll put it on the side. We won't even look at it. We can try again later if you feel like trying it again later. But then as a teacher, you see, okay, they struggled with subtraction. I'm going to find ways to have them be successful with subtraction, small ways outside of the test. Build them up so that they feel better about it and they have successful stories and feelings um, outside of the test. Like I think as a society, we just overvalue tests way too much. And the problem with that, the, we're, I'm not saying tests are not valuable, but tests do not always measure learning. And we want learning, right? For example, in math, if you change one word in a word problem, it looks totally different. So I have teachers all the time that are teaching this type of problem and they teach it over and the kids are super successful in that type of problem. Come the state test, it's the exact same problem, same type of problem, but they worded it a little different. Out the window. 
It doesn't mean that their brain didn't have the capacity to do it. It just meant that there was something in the test that prevented them from making the connection. And so now, even though they were 100% successful in doing that type of math in my classroom and the test, they couldn't do it on the test, you know, it creates math anxiety. That's, that's so opposite of learning. Thank you, any other questions? That's super helpful. I just wanted to point out in the chat, I put a link to, for those of you who are interested in early childhood and, and the, the parent who was talking about her five-year-old and this, the tests being really developmentally inappropriate and such a high emphasis on standardization, there's a really great resource um, by the Dream Project out of Stanford University. And I, I will put the link in the chat again. Um, they really focus on building efficacy, not just in the students' early abilities of learning math, but in those who are educating early childhood children. Because as Dr. Tano said, it is a cycle. So if I'm someone who has math phobia, even when I'm working with my preschool children, I am projecting that math phobia onto them, or I am hesitating in teaching them those foundational skills in math. And so then what happens to those little ones and they start developing that math phobia because they don't have the skills because their teacher did not feel confident enough to teach them those skills. So then they go into kindergarten, first grade, feeling ill-equipped and not prepared. And so then that cycle perpetuates itself. So we really have to kind of start with the education aspect with educators and thinking about how can we build that those foundational math skills? How can we partner with families and parents and building that confidence, as Dr. Tano said, having more positive experiences around math. So we're not continuing mm -hmm. um, you know, to perpetuate the cycle. So that is one um, program that I've gone to their workshops and they've done really, really great um, presentations and they have great resources and they're very research-based, but it's all about promoting early math literacy. So that's a, a website that I would highly encourage you to all check out. Yeah, and I see this question here. What is your advice for future educators who struggled with math in the past? My advice is to embrace that. That is a very powerful experience to have struggled with math in the past. When students know that you struggled with math, it really empowers them. Um, so my personal experience is that I failed algebra when I was in high school. I had to I took pre-algebra in summer school. I failed it as a ninth grader and I had to take it again. And um, because of that, it set me behind for the rest of my high school year so that when I got to college, I had to start in math 101. And I ended up, ended up having to take so many math courses in college that when I became a teacher, that was the, the course that made the most sense. And I was very strong in math by that point. But when I tell my students that when I was their age, I failed in math, they, they light up because they think I was not, I'm not the only one. I'm like, no, you're not the only one. You can do it. And um, it's actually harder when you're somebody who has always been strong in math. It's hard for you to understand what the students are going through. So the fact that you struggled with math in the past is a super powerful tool for you. Um, to work with the students. They love it. I've never had a bad reaction when I told my students that I also struggled in math. Um, okay, um, I think I saw one more hand. Okay, so I'm just looking in here. My son shuts down in class when the teacher um, tries to push him. Yeah, so, so this presentation is mostly like from the teacher side. But as a parent side, I know that, that you see that as well. And sometimes as a parent or as a teacher, you have to combat the other side. Um, and you have to create, like I have parents who tell their kids awful things about math and then they come here and I have to combat that. It's the same the other way around is that, um, you know, if the child sees that their teacher is disappointed, but then when they go home, you are also disappointed, that's a double hit on the child's psyche. And so you want to tell them it's okay, you know, um, we'll learn little at a time, you know, every teacher is different and then talk to the teacher and say, hey, how can we make my child feel um, good about being in the math classroom? All right. 
Any final thoughts? We have a couple of minutes left. I did also put into the chat, there is a link to our Teach LARC YouTube where you will be able to find the recording. So give us again about 24 to 48 hours after the um, virtual workshop series ends tomorrow, and then you should be able to see all of the recordings there. So I will put that in the link again. It's just the TEACH LARC, which stands for TEACH Los Angeles Regional Consortium, or Regional Collaborative, sorry, uh, it's literally right behind me. Um, so you'll be able to find uh, all of the sessions, and even from previous virtual workshop series, because we do one every spring and one every fall for the past, I believe, four or five years we've been doing these um, pre-pandemic, they were in person. So you may not see all of the recordings for those. Thank you everybody for your time and for listening. Um, I will put my email in the chat again in case anybody has any other questions. Feel free to reach out and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Yay, this was awesome. Thank you everyone so much for your participation. Thank you, Dr. Tano. Thank you. This is really, really helpful for me as a parent of a fourth grader and a second grader and a teacher of future teachers. This is all super, super valuable. Yeah. Celebrate the failures. Celebrate the successes. Don't give too much pressure on, on learning, math, testing, and grading, but more the ex value the experiences. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon, and we hope to see you in, in other sessions. Thank you, Marini. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.